Hello everyone, welcome to Silicium Tech. Today we will see about Autosaw methodology. Methodology here we will discuss uh, about the uh, methods and procedures given by the Autosaw consortium. So the first part will be the methods uh, used in the Autosaw basic software development and the second part will be uh, the methods and a uh, procedure for the overall system development for the Autosaw software. Okay, when we consider Autosaw basic software, this can be implemented in three ways according to the uh, implementation conformance classes defined by Autosaw. So we call it as ICC1, ICC2 and ICC3. Uh, when we consider the conformance class 1 or the ICC1, uh, it is the simplest uh, of the class. Uh, this we develop uh, software according basic software according to this class then what we need to do is we just need to have a basic software and RTE this basic software and RTE could be clubbed together and it can be as a single unit the basic software need not be grouped uh, or splitted into smaller modules uh, everything could be one big uh, black box and whatever that comes out of this black box uh, should be uh, compliant to Autosar, so the interfaces coming out of this should be Autosar compliant. Uh, but whatever we do inside the basic software uh, can be up to us. Uh, so this is the most simplest method. Although we could uh, create a software uh, with this method, uh, typically this is uh, not done. There are like couple of uh, cases where this is used. Uh, one, one could be where a legacy project uh, is uh, moved from the old structure to Atasa, then this could be a first step uh, in, in the transfer process. Or uh, if we use a, a Atasa application along with legacy uh, basic software, then we could also use this uh, ICC1. These are the cases which uh, I have come across. Then we have the ICC2, the conformance class 2. Uh, here uh, the modules are logically grouped uh, as per the functions. For example, the memory services, memory hardware abstraction and memory drivers. All these three are grouped as a memory stack. Similarly, we have the communication stack, system stack, IO stack, etc. So everything inside the stack can be uh, developed according to our own uh, wishes. Uh, but uh, each stack should communicate with the other stack with uh, the Autosar uh, interface and uh, the communication with RTE should also happen uh, as per the Autosar uh, interface standards. This will help uh, in uh, different vendors providing uh, different uh, stacks for the same ECU software. So then uh, we have the ICC3, Conformance Class 3. So this has all the uh, modules uh, and uh, each module should communicate with other module as per the Autosar uh, interfaces and uh, it should be developed according to the Autosar standards. So this uh, is uh, similar to the architecture which I showed in the earlier video. Now uh, we will see the overall Autosar methodology. So this is let's say this is the left side of the vehicle where uh, the OEM decides to have a vehicle project and uh, they decide what are the features the vehicle has uh, should have and uh, they give these requirements uh, to the suppliers and the supplier develop uh, the ECU and the software and uh, create the structure and they generate uh, the ECU code. So till this, uh, we have uh, the uh, methodology uh, defined by Atosa. So uh, this is the diagram which shows this. And uh, so the first step is the input configuration. So creating this system configuration input XML. Uh, this XML will contain uh, a list of uh, which are the software components that should be uh, present. So this is decided uh, based on the uh, features the vehicle should have. Based on the features, they will uh, list which software components should be there. And they also decide uh, how, what is the network topology of the vehicle? Uh, what are the buses uh, that should be 
how many ECUs it should have and how the ECUs are connected to the buses. And it also has uh, system con uh, constraints uh, mentioned. So uh, system constraints uh, forbid uh, certain software components to be present in certain ECU. And then the OEM does the configure system uh, step where they uh, group the atomic software components to the ECUs and they also assign the network uh, topology and then they create the system configuration description. From the system configuration description, uh, they then extract uh, ECU specific information. So, for example, uh, they will uh, extract the information for engine ECU and create uh, something called as ECU extract. Uh, so, this ECU extract will be for engine ECU. Similarly, they will uh, do it for all ECUs. And once uh, the ECU extract is ready, uh, then the, this ECU extract will be given to the supplier. Uh, to uh, configure uh, uh, to develop the EC and the supplier will take the ECU extract and they will see which are the software components to be present, uh, how the network topology is, then they do the ECU configuration where they uh, do the ECU hardware pin configurations and uh, they uh, define the interfaces with, within the software components uh, and uh, how they are interacting uh, between them. Let's take an example. We will consider a hypothetical example with a below features. So uh, it has a diesel engine and it has, uh, let's say, the following software components, accelerator, pedal input, engine speed input, and fuel pump control and injection control. And uh, we also have the features of uh, ABS and rollover stability, which has a vehicle speed input, lateral acceleration input, and wheel speed inputs, wheel speed control. Then we have the automatic transmission. Uh, for that, we have the speed input and uh, gear uh, control. Then we have the adaptive cruise control, where we have a speed input, object detection, uh, cruise uh, control output, start stop, and and with respect to topology, let's say we have the engine ECU, brake ECU, cruise control, and gearbox ECU. Uh, then we have the CAN uh, bus, only the CAN bus. As discussed uh, earlier in the configure system, these features will be mapped to engine ECU and uh, brake ECU, transmission ECU and cruise control ECU. And uh, the topology is CAN, uh, so the software components will be put uh, inside accordingly and uh, the communication between these components will happen via uh, CAN signals. So for this example, OEM will do all the steps I mentioned earlier like configuring the system, creating the ECU specific extract, giving the ECU extract to uh, the supplier and then the supplier uh, configures the uh, uh, each ECU. So there could be multiple suppliers and uh, for example, engine ECU can be done by uh, one uh, company and gearbox uh, could be done by another company and brake could be by another, etc. And uh, they configure the ECU, so all the basics of the configuration uh, and uh, the basics of the development and uh, the applications of the development as well. And once uh, they are done, uh, with it, uh, the, they will uh, generate the ECU code. So here, uh, the important thing is that we could have parallel development. Once the supplier has the ECU extract, they will uh, define uh, what are the software components and what are the interfaces which are uh, used uh, between the software components. And in the uh, contract phase, uh, they will uh, generate some headers and give it to uh, each uh, software developer for the uh, each uh, software component and uh, the requirement for the software components could also be given in parallel. Uh, so the process of developing of the software component code and uh, the process of configuring the ECU basic software can happen in parallel. And once uh, both of these are done, at the final stage, uh, all these things can be put together and the RT can be generated and software can be built. We will uh, see about uh, this uh, part where uh, we we have the IT contract phase and generation phase. These things can be uh, seen in the next video. That's all for today. If you have any questions, please leave it in the comment section. 
please do subscribe to the channel and share the videos